Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 863. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 19th, 2024. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We appreciate you're here. This is this is my happy place and George's happy place. We just turn on the webcams, we set the focus, we get the audio levels, and we talk about things that we find interesting around the world, mostly Anglican, obviously Christian, sometimes political. That's just like we like to do. Sometimes we say, hey, it's hot here. George, how's the weather in Florida? It's hot here. <laughs> yeah, it's hot here. <laughs> I'm, I'm in Twin Falls, Idaho this week, and uh, yesterday it was uh, a high of 68 degrees. No humidity, little wind out of the north. It was really nice. So I, I, I think I found my happy spot right now. We're actually heading uh, a little further east into Idaho uh, later this week, and then we're going down to Yellowstone. And that should be fun. Not been there before. Uh, but we're continuing our adventures. Um, boy, anything else we need to talk about before we start? How are you doing, George? I'm doing fine. But Kevin, you should continue on to Jackson Hole and say hello to Catherine Jeffords Shorey. She there? is. Uh, that's where she is right now. She's <laughs> uh-huh. at the Episcopal Church there and is the acting bishop of Wyoming. But I think you should make, you know, <laughs> you know, re- reestablish uh... ties. Hi, it's KJK. Hi, KJS. Oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure she'd be happy to, 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 to meet up with me. All right, let's, let's get to the news stories here. Um, people want to know what happened with the Global South Assembly. It met outside Cairo last week. Uh, have they chosen a new archbishop, Kevin? And George, tell us the name of the new archbishop to replace Canterbury. And I got bad news. Has not been released yet. Has not been scheduled yet, but they did have a good uh, tete-on-tete discussion about ways forward, uh, re- re- reiterating their Ash Wednesday call, and basically confirming that, yes, Justin Welby has forfeited the office of the leader of the Anglican Communion, but I don't see an immediate solution, George. It was a bit of a disappointment for some people were thinking this was going to be the showdown where the Global South would basically declare its independence, uh, create a new first among equal, and go forward. Didn't happen. And as Kevin pointed out, it's not scheduled to happen. And they only repeated past statements. So it, it, to take a negative review aspect to it, this is akin to my daughter when she's in high school saying, Daddy, I hate you. And then asking me for money bucks. to go out later. <laughs> yes. You know, I have 20 bucks. <laughs> so there's, uh, so what's going on? Um, what we saw were there is no United Global South. There are many, many, many factions that we saw here. And this the it, it came to the floor on several points where these factions basically disagreed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeff Walton, uh, who was there uh, for Anglican Unscripted and Anglican <laughs> Inc. and Juicy Ecumenism. <laughs> He uh, reported that Justin Badiarama tried, who was the chairman, tried three times to close the meeting. And the delegates refused because they wanted some harder statements affirming GAFCON, affirming things. And Justin Badiarama and some one faction within the leadership didn't want to go there. So what, who, who, who well, do we well, have well, here? Well, yeah, let's back up. Who are the factions? We have the uh, anti Welby anti-Canterbury faction. We have the pro-GAFCON, pro-ACNA faction, and then some minor factions within there. Explain that. Well, we have the anti the anti-Canterbury faction. Those are the people who want action, they want it now. Mm-hmm. And you could probably put, I hate to put it this way, but the white churches, mm-hmm. the Sydney, Australia, ACNA, Anglican, Anglicans in England, uh, Brazil. They have played the game long enough to basically realize that salvation is not to be found through relationship to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And they do not see, they do not believe it is right and proper for the first among equals to be chosen by the British Prime Minister, who currently is a Hindu. And if he loses, he'll be replaced by an atheist. 
and Welby will be the Welby successor be named by an atheist. Could it be any and, worse? Is my yes. question. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. So they and they have no faith in Justin Welby as a man. They've mm -hmm. just basically thrown up their hands about them. And so these were some of the people who really were pushing hard and and some of and a number of them in the US and the UK were waiting for this to be the showdown. Mm -hmm. And when it didn't happen, I got a number of emails and messages bewailing the fact that this statement they released, the communique, could have been written, written 10 years ago. Nothing new here, just same old, same old. So that's what I would call the anti-Welby, anti-Canterbury faction. Now, there's a pro-Canterbury, anti-Welby faction. And that's people like Singapore, Tanzania, uh, South Sudan. They have no patience with Justin Welby. They basic, but they say he's going to be gone in a year or two. Let's just wait and see who the next Archbishop of Canterbury is, because we need, in our particular circumstances, these links to Canterbury. Uh, why does that matter? Well, for instance, uh, Justin Welby recently did a tour of Central America. He went to Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama, uh, Costa Rica. He did the little show, wore the sombreros, had tacos and everything. But he met with the presidents of each of these nations, and the little small churches in these countries were given a domestic boost by somebody connected to the British government. So for them, the tie of the fact that they're bishops in the House of Lords, that Welby is, has the ear, they believe, of the prime minister, that you know, British aid, British foreign policy, that they're connected to something that has a greater, de greater significance than just an ecclesiastical organization. So for South Sudan, which has been going through a terrible civil war for years. Mm -hmm. um, which Justin Welby tried to intervene. Yes, yeah. he went there with the Pope uh, yeah. and whatnot. They are pro Canterbury. They're not ready to cut the umbilical cord. They want to be part of this greater uh, thing, but they just don't have any uh, patience with Justin Welby. And we saw that because who they invited, they invited Anthony Pogo, who was the Anglican Consultative Council General Secretary, who used to be Welby's advisor who is a South Sudanese bishop himself. Now, Pogo has been sort of a, what I would call a whip for, for Welby. Uh, in Mozambique and Angola, he went down there when they were having problems with the old pro-Welby archbishop. Uh, Pogo uh, went in there and said, you know, back this guy and elect somebody who to replace him who is pro-Welby. He interferes and he has denied this, and there have been statements from the Anglican <clears throat> Union News Service attacking Anglican Inc. for saying these terrible things, which we get directly from the horse's mouth from the from these countries where Pogo yeah. is trying to get people on side for Welby. Well, they gave him an honored place in this meeting. They gave him a speech, and they gave him a, an opportunity to speak, and they gave him, uh, and Titus uh, Chung, the Archbishop of Singapore, echoed in a Bible study on Ephesians, the, the, the unity at all costs mantra that we saw at the Lambeth Conference, that we saw Anthony Pogo give. And they also invited Paul Donison from GAFCON, but there's a difference between putting somebody at the head table and putting, seating somebody next to the men's room door. Um, GAFCON was not as beloved by some group as was Pogo. Then we have the GAFCON group. Nigeria and Rwanda, for instance, where like they'll show up, they send minor level functionaries because, you know, their money and their time and their hearts invested in GAFCON. And then we have like the Ugandans, who are another faction, who are anti Welby and sort of anti Canterbury, like the you know, the, the Egyptians, but they real but they're not willing to toss the whole thing away. So we have all, <clears throat> there's not a common vision. And then and you I, had some real strange kickers in there. Yeah, the Chinese. We'll get to that in a second. But, you know, there was an agreement uh, a couple of years ago that, listen, we'll let the Global South take on the politics. We'll let GAFCON take on the mission. And GAFCON has done a fairly well good job of taking on the mission and working within countries and, uh, and spreading the gospel. 
They've taken on their mantra of what they were going to do. But the Global South here has gathered, and um, this is a swig and a miss. And I'm going to discuss that because they invited the Chinese. They're hopping out of bed with Welby and jumping in to the Communist Party. This is very dangerous. And the Singapore, Southeast Asia, extended an invitation to the China Christian Council Three Self Patriotic Movement, which is the official state church of China. Mm-hmm. Now, so what you may say, they come, they, they're issued invitations to general convention of the Episcopal Church and, and so on and so forth. Well, they took this seriously, the Chinese, and they got copies of all the papers translated into Mandarin ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And they sent a high-powered delegation, oh. one of the leaders yeah. of this <clears throat> state church in China. And on one level, this is a wonderful fit because the Chinese Protestant church is against transgenderism. That queer and queer community, and yes. On, you know, they're, they're on side on all the human, you know, human sexuality, abortion, Identity all this politics, and that. Yeah. Identity politics, they are perfectly in line. However, the theology of the Chinese church is heretical. Why do I say heretical? And I'm not just being unkind. The official doctrine of the China of the three self patriotic movement is justification by works. You are not saved by faith, but you are saved by good works. And here's the kicker: the good works are those identified by the Chinese Communist Party to serve the party. To serve the party. Yeah. Now, this. I'm going to sort of get a little wider here. China's foreign policy has been pushing what is called the Belt and Road Initiative, Mm -hmm. where they are doing investment and work in third world countries to basically break the influence of the West so that there's a lot of investment in places like Zimbabwe and Zambia and all the different stands in Central Asia. South Sudan, the Chinese oil companies are trying to get a foothold in there. And having the Chinese church reach out to the national churches of these countries is part of Chinese foreign policy. So on one level, we can talk about what we agree on, on morals and ethics, but we just won't mention that our doctrines are different. Now, what's the result? Sorry. I, I want to go a little further. They're not just doing financial resources in these countries. They're indebting these countries. You know, several African countries owe billions of dollars in debt to China. And that's how China influences the politics in those countries to leave the West and support China. Hey, by the way, we'll let this little you know, interest payment go this month if you uh, uh, go to the UN and, and vote for this topic in favor of China. You know? And so Justin Badiarama was telling people that we should take a Global South delegation to China and visit and talk. And because the Chinese have said, well, we can provide scholarships for students to study at, you know, the Chinese seminaries, um, which are all government run, government controlled. They teach the party lot. Now, the average parish minister or priest is thoroughly Orthodox, thoroughly Christian in China. It's just that top leadership that is utterly corrupted. It's like Russia in the Stalin days. You know, all the bishops you can assume are KGB hacks. And it's just the persecuted clergy who are faithful. So maybe there's a long game being played here that, you know, we need to establish relations. Or maybe there's just the enemy of my enemy is my friend, the worldview. And I'm, I'm afraid that hopping out of bed with Welby into bed with uh, Chairman Xi is not an improvement. Well, I would say the last 80 years of China proves that the underground church is the future. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's grown, it's solid, it can't be stopped. Um, we've, we've not heard a report once about the underground church, of the, a persecuted church, indeed, uh, reducing size. You know, it, it continues to grow. And I would assume GAFCON, a, a missionary uh, ministry, if there ever there was one, is involved in the uh, underground church, I would hope. So, I don't know. Well, Kevin, you and I have heard rumors and stories, which we cannot confirm, uh, confirm 
about this work. Mm -hmm. um, work, uh, you know, Koreans living in China are said to have their own Anglican bishop, um, mm -hmm. who is a secret bishop. Um, is that true? I don't know. Uh, the, uh, but the Anglican Church in China was officially shut down in the 50s. Half of their bishops disappeared into the concentration camp system. And one of them, K.H. Ting, became a turncoat yep. and basically uh, became a parrot of the Communist Party. So there are faithful Chinese Anglicans who died for the faith and died for, you know, Christian principles. They morphed into the underground church. And there's some, uh, K.H. Ting being the most prominent, who went over to the enemy. Well, I want to, you know, let people know there are lots of pros to this conference as well. You know, they got yeah. together. They they know what the problem is. They've just not offered a solution. Now, their solution is to have a covenant church. So maybe that will work. They, they did what I would call second and third level stuff well. They, they got a lot of paperwork done, a lot of admin done. They elected uh, councils and delegates and things of that. Problem is, will the authority that the, this group creates be recognized by its member churches? We saw this problem in Gafcon, where at Gafcon the primates moratorium on women bishops. South uh, South Sudan said, "Oh, okay," and then went and did it anyway. And Kenya said, uh, "I can't override my House of Bishops who wants to do this." So the covenant is only as strong as the local church is willing to make it and is this a question of time is this a question of you know money i don't know well now i remember gafcon bringing people and archbishops together at the archbishop level and that haunted them because there's always a new archbishop of province is this new covenant done at the archbishop level or the province level? Well, there are a, there's a primates council, then there's a you know bishop group of bishops and a group of clergy and laity. But do but does what does their gathering yeah. have any? Well, let's say the global south adopts a policy on something. Will that bind the ACNA? Not unless the ACNA assembly or College of Bishops authorizes it. Now, I can't, you know, you and I can't think of something where they might diverge, but let's say they do something kooky, like make some statement about Israel that may Oof. work well yeah. in the third world, but yeah. would be poison in the United States, which is pro-Israel. Will the bishops in the United States adopt an anti-Israel, you know, Zionism is racism sort of stuff? No. But thank goodness, here's the good news. Okay. They didn't get into the mosquito net crap or the, no. you know. United Nations, yeah. United Nations stuff or all the lies of the last generation. Global warming. George Floyd was guilty. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble with people. <laughs> uh, uh, DEI is a wonderful thing. All those lies are nowhere to be seen. If you want all that crap, go to General Convention of the Episcopal Church and you'll get more than you could possibly ever want. But none of that crap, excuse me, none of that non-important, not or none of that nonsense yes. was involved here. Now, it, it's not nonsense. It's just white noise. They want to talk about the gospel. It is white noise. It is white noise. It's the first world problem. It's, you know, they want to gather and talk about, you know, uh, growing the church. Let's just turn up the white noise a little bit with mosquito nets and global warming so we can get them off topic. And it, it happens all the time, which is going to happen this week, I hear, in Louisville. <coughs> where, where are we meeting again for General Convention? Pistol Church, General yeah. Convention, 81st General Conventions meeting oh. in Louisville, Kentucky. Boy, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> I am accredited as a journalist uh, mm -hmm. remotely. I'm not going to mm -hmm. bother going. Yeah. I didn't go to the last one because they made me get a COVID shot and I didn't want to go and it wasn't worth going. And I was right. It wasn't worth going. No. But the uh, uh, the big news is they're going to elect a new presiding bishop. Um, there are five candidates. 
mm-hmm. uh, a woman, a black bishop, a Hispanic bishop, and two boring white bishops, one from Erie and one from Nebraska. Went into a bar. What's the punchline? I don't I mean... know, but there are no rabbis. In <laughs> no rabbis. Now, uh, if you want me to guess, I'd say uh, Bishop Gutierrez of Pennsylvania will get the nod because it's that group's turn. Well, not just yeah. that. I, I think with the illegal alien uh, infestation we have here in America, the broken border, of course you want to have a Hispanic in, in office. Yeah, but here's the thing. I'm going into Hispanic, Hispanic stuff. If you look at Bishop Gutierrez, he is as he has no Indian ancestry, if you look oh, at him. He looks, like, <laughs> he looks like a picture from... Uh, one of these 15th century Spanish, you know, El Greco portraits, a very thin with a pointy. He looks like a conquistador. He does not look like a conquistador. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bishop Gutierrez is of a European ancestry. Uh-huh. All right. I, I'll stop there. I don't want to do this. Is an ancest, ancestry.com. You know. Uh, he is what the, uh, the race people say in this country, the left calls a white Hispanic. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the Zimmerman fellow in Orlando who right. sh- shot Trayvon Martin. Okay. Now, I would say because the, we had a woman, then we had a black man. If we're going to play the DEI game, whose turn is it? It's Hispanics. Um, and Gutierrez has done a pretty good job in Pennsylvania. Now, anybody following Charles Benison would do a good job. It's not, you know, a very high bar to get over. However, Michael Curry uh, released uh, last week saying three of the five people have uh, disciplinary proceedings against them. Title force. Title force out of pure transparency. And thank goodness the Episcopal Church did this. They didn't have to. They could have hidden this. Um, But uh, D.D. Duncan Probe, who was the woman, Bishop of Central New York, has been accused in a Title IV complaint of inflating her resume, claiming well, a doctor. Did not Catherine Jeffert Shorey do the same as a uh, a dean of some university somewhere? What was that about? Dean of a seminary. Yeah. Yes. Which was an adult education class at her parish. Hmm. Uh, well, Dee Dee Duncan Probe, has a doctorate from the graduate theological fellowship or union or something. Uh, but her advisor was a Christchurch college, Oxford. And it is alleged that she led on that she has a D Phil from Oxford when she has a PhD from the graduate theological, whatever she still has the doctorate, mm-hmm. but she's accused of sort of dressing it up a bit to make it look a little more, uh, prestigious than that. Okay. The Bishop, in Atlanta, uh, Bishop Wright is accused of being racist against a black Episcopal women's group who basically were a little crazy. And allegedly, black bishop, allegedly he's, and he basically shut this, you know, shut, shut down the uh, crazy ladies fighting the patriarchy group. Mm-hmm. And that was racist. And of course he's black. So I, I don't know how that works, but that went nowhere. Mm-hmm. And Bishop Gutierrez disciplined a priest for something, and he had a harsh sentence, and he was put up on Title IV charges for allegedly being too mean and too harsh. Oh, stop again. Did not KJS depose some 770 priests? Was that not too harsh? Yes, and remember... Are these not qualifications uh, for arch, for presiding yeah. bishop of the Episcopal Church? <laughs> And, and KJS ignored a, when she was Bishop of Nebraska, ignored a, somebody who had been kicked out of the Catholic priesthood for being a, a, a abuser. Yeah. She received him into the Episcopal church as a priest in Nebraska, in uh, Nevada when she was Bishop there. So she's, she goes both directions. See, it, so but, in my mind, these title four accusations are a way to trump up these people in the election here. Scott Baker, the Bishop of Nebraska is, somebody who he's one of these people who will always be in the background of a picture you know and sean Rowe, the bishop of erie or northwestern pennsylvania is a bit of a blowhard he loves to hear himself talk mm-hmm. so he'd be perfect but he's one of these guys that uh you know takes himself very seriously but no one else does so 
it just look just plain politics i would say it's gutierrez is I, race I to agree. lose because yeah. being accused of being too harsh for a gun uh, in the sentence of somebody who did a bad thing is not disqualifying no. um so yeah so, i i so, agree it's the hispanic is most likely to be chosen next presiding bishop and then we'll have stuff on uh the only thing that i'm interested in is raising the retirement age to 75. uh i like i like my job and i don't want them to the only way they can get i have tenure of office meaning i like tenure university i you know i can show up on sunday mornings for four hours and that's all i have to do and they can't fire me i wouldn't do that but uh, that's tenure uh i love what i do and that i can do it till i'm 72 and now they're going to raise it to 75 um hopefully but then there are a lot of silly stuff that of absolutely no consequence but the big thing that i'm that you can take away from all and oh there's an election for president of the house of deputies which is one of these jobs within the episcopal church that is very important at convention but very not one important. in a thousand episcopalians know who that is yeah. and here it's a choice between a hispanic woman a native american woman and a black woman all of whom complain about the patriarchy it's almost like an episode of south park uh put a woman in it and make it gay uh was one episode i remember it was yeah uh, that uh, uh you know but these people are of no real consequence um you know it, they just don't matter to the life of the parish well they get good speaking engagements they get good honorarium when they go around and speak for the uh the three years they that they're not 100 yeah. plus thousand a year in salary they get paid yeah. for this job Thanks. so but the but the big issue that I see is that there is no attempt to change the trajectory of the Episcopal Church. Um, we're going to approve the merger of three dioceses in the state of Wisconsin, Fond du Lac, Eau Claire, and Milwaukee into one diocese. Um, Eastern and Western Michigan are going to be merging. There's that's going to be acted upon at this convention. There's talk at a future convention of merging New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. Um, the Episcopal Church is declining rapidly, and and there's also talk of reducing the diocesan assessments uh, down from their 19% down to 10% because the diocese don't have the income. And the trust fund monies are running out. They're being spent on DEI initiatives that are not producing any return on income. So the trajectory is down. But there are no steps to address any of this. There's no grand scheme for evangelization. There's no grand scheme for anything other than institutional protection. It's, well, it, I wanna... it, it's, it's depressing because nothing will change. It'll only get worse in the aggregate. Some dioceses are doing some well. Some parishes are doing very well. Um, I, I want to give you hope here, George. I, Back up, I'm going to give you hope in the Episcopal Church. You are worried that at some point they will kick you out because you're going to outage your office. And I say, in a church that believes in trans, you can wake up one day when you're 76 and say, I feel 75. And you can still go to work. That's hope. Right there. You just tell your bishop, I feel 75 today. Okay, George. Well, there is a narcissistic element in this of mine, and that uh -oh. I feel a call to serve these people. Mm -hmm. And I don't see a lot of people coming up after me who I would be willing to turn over my life's work to. I hate to put it that way because that sounds awfully pretentious, but, you know, we're doing good things here, and I have a real sense that my life's work is to minister and love the people in this county. And I'm going to do it with every breath of my body until I can no longer physically do it. Because, you know, I see the people, gosh, the people coming out of seminary who are our age, you know, second and third career people. Um, it's just the future is not looking good. Yeah, I mean, but that's kind of the, the same thought that every bishop has. Oh, my Lord, there's, I, I'm going to retire soon. Who are they going to replace me with and what's going to happen to this diocese? You know, you have the same thought as a priest. 
oh my lord, one day I'm going to have to retire. What are they going to do to this church that uh, God has built up in, in Lucanto? You know, all these people who, re, who rely on uh, me representing the salt and light uh, to this community. Yeah. As I said, I, I admit it's narcissistic. I admit yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not proud of that, but I think it, it does need to be mentioned. Yeah. It's not that I'm hanging on for the income, which is nice, but rather because a sense of, because uh, I've like, gosh, let's look just in the last few years, look what happened to Albany. Look what happened, you know. Just like that. Yeah. Just like that. It flipped. It just flipped, you know, and the work. You know, Bishop Herzog, Bishop Love, and all the Bennett, guys yeah, before, yeah. Bishop Benna. What's it going to come out to? There are going to be some st still bright spots, but what's the general? It's just been. Yeah. Uh, uh, in other news, the ACNA is also having their provincial assembly coming up. They're going to choose a new archbishop. Now, this is, I'm not saying this to hurt anybody's feelings okay i'm saying this because i've been following the acna since day one and to be very honest the acna is full of wonderful good bishops a couple duds that's fine um but not every bishop would make a good archbishop i'm going to put that right out there I, that's my first uh, uh prevailing line for this this uh, new segment not every bishop would make a good archbishop the ACNA has been blessed so far, in my humble opinion, uh, by uh, Archbishop Duncan and the follow-up with Archbishop Foley. And uh, there's been some news this week that uh, leaves me a little confused as to uh, where people's uh, allegiance lie in this. And uh, we should talk a little bit about this. Um, what else have my notes there? Uh, we'll start with that, George. Uh, it's up and coming. Uh, they could blow it. They could choose a, a, a dud. Or the ACNA could continue to be a growing denomination in North America. Well, let's define a dud. Uh, there, there is the <laughs> obvious dud. And there are some bishops who are not too bright. Not too, you know. No names. No names. No, no who names. are basically uh, tiresome. And then there's some zealot type bishops. Mm -hmm. My way of the highway. Mm -hmm. Do it, you know, that I, this is the ditch I'm going to die in. And we must, you know, have this issue resolved today. Otherwise, the, you know, the world will end. Bob Duncan and Foley Beach are on different sides of the women's orders issues. Yet they were able to be both pragmatic and godly. You know, building a church out of a disparate group of people, Anglo-Catholics, Evangelicals, Charismatics, people on the Canterbury Trail, mm -hmm. uh, people with no Anglican background whatsoever who are attracted to the liturgy, doctrine, and discipline. Or people who are just on the same side of a single issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, they, they have been able to build a thriving church. Now, yes, COVID knocked everybody for a loop, and but it's coming back. It's coming back faster than most other mainline churches and i would say the acna is part of the main line Protestant yep. main line if they choose somebody who decides today is the day that we're going to resolve issues one two and three forever you'll blow the thing up there's more the episcopal church the election of a presiding bishop will be interesting but unless we do have a holy spirit movement uh, where somebody is there who can basically reignite the faith, it's not much new is going to happen. The, very different from the ACNA. It, the a, election, the ACNA can allow somebody who can continue this work of God or who can blow the darn thing up. I see two major issues, and I've seen them since day one in the ACNA. The first is non-geographical diocese. They need to set on paper an end date 10 years from now we will only have geographical dioceses a bishop will represent a geography a place on a map not several places on a map and that is an issue that they need to overcome quickly 
I've watched the ACNA struggle and grow and have ups and downs. But when I travel, the one thing I hear most is, why can't I have a local bishop? Why is my bishop in Texas? Why is my bishop in California? Why is my bishop in you know the Carolinas? And why do we have six overcrossing geographical dioceses in, in South Carolina? I mean, it, it, it's crazy. And I think you know you need to, as a college of bishops, set a date and say, you know, in 2034, 20, yeah, it's 10 years, 2034. Oh my gosh, 2034 is right around the corner. In 10 years, <laughs> We will no longer have non-geographical diocese. We will not have flying bishops. We will be united as one. Boy, there's a lot to do to get there. There's some big issues you got to overcome to get there. But isn't that part of being in the body of Christ is overcoming the big issues and not just letting those elephant in the room st uh, stick around? And, you know, I think setting that date will help people to see the further vision in the ACNA. First of all, oh my gosh, we're going to be around in 10 more years. Yes, you are. Uh, it depends a lot on this next archbishop, but uh, in as such, you're going to have to overcome two or three lesser issues that are important to the body of your church. And um, 10 years, that's one archbishop's reign in the ACNA, George. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So they have to choose wisely. They have to choose wisely. And we really, uh, you and I were privy to the, I don't want to call them shenanigans, but the jockeying that company Difficulty. the Difficulty. Difficulties. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and what saved the day was an action of grace on the part of one bishop um who will remain un unnamed you know but uh what, 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 in other words he could have blown the whole thing up then but he chose to swallow his ambitions and pride and allow the church to be unified do you know what you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking. About. I mean, I don't know how to say this without saying getting too detailed. But I, but I don't think he compromised. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's one thing to compromise your principles. This gentleman did not, and it's one thing to say, you know, for the greater good, for the longevity and long-term vision of the ACNA, um, I will step aside for this. And I, th you know, he was my candidate. Don't, let me just say, you know, up front, he, he was my guy. But uh, in that, uh, it allowed ACNA a chance to breathe and grow and become uh, more identified with who the ACNA was. And it showed the world that the ACNA, you know, even though it has these big, practical, real tough issues, it can still grow. Mm -hmm. Even though that there is this elephant in the room, and any time you look around, people are talking about the elephant, God is still using the ACNA to grow. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, so yes, uh, the next archbishop has maybe the most important role of the last... 15 years uh, in setting forth the course of ending non-geographical and tackling those big issues. Not, but well, not with the same my way or the highway. In many ways, we're talking about the same issues that is besetting the global South, mm -hmm. that we have these different factions. And the problem is that there is no overarching leader who can unite all these factions into a common goal. The ACNA has pro-women, anti-women, hyper-Anglo-Catholics, hyper-charismatics. We've got C4SO all the way to the Diocese of Fort Worth. Um, and Foley Beach and Bob Duncan have been able to keep all these people in the tent, in fellowship. Um, it, Global South hasn't found their Foley Beach or Bob Duncan. That's one of the problems they're having. And 
in other words, let's say there's a faction very strong led by Fort Worth and other dioceses, and there's a clergy petition saying no women clergy. Mm -hmm. Let's have a moratorium. Let's stop it. Well, that's popular among one group, but then you have dioceses of Mid-Atlantic and Pittsburgh, and I think Gulf Atlantic, well, Mid-Atlantic and Pittsburgh for certain are quite keen on women clergy and are not going to undo quickly or easily. Or where you were, uh, Bill Murdoch's old diocese, what was that? I, what was it called? Up there in the Middle East. Know, yeah, Northeast. North, North. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they were not going to drop uh, women clergy and whatnot. So you've got that issue. Then you've got the uh, you've got the perpetual C four S O issue of just gnawing at the sidelines of trying to introduce the LGBT agenda, of introducing pride uh, stuff and introducing you know the no get it, the camel getting its nose under the edge of the tent. Um, that's a real concern, and yeah. you know. Bishops may make statements, we're not going to do this anymore, but if they're ignored by the individual diocese, you know, what does it mean? Yeah. Are they going to, uh, we talked, we covered this last week where we talked about how a gay, uh, gay monk covenanting thing was held in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, in a C4SO parish, even though the College of Pres Bishops said, we're not doing any of this stuff. Anymore. Presided over by Bishop Todd Hunter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, how far is the live and let live uh, go along to get along ethos? Because, you know, if somebody says, well, if they can do that, then we can do this. Has that not also been an issue for the 2000 years of the, the church? There's, you know, whether it be Roman Catholic, whether it be Anglican, Lutheran, uh, any, has there always not been the, we're not going to bother with that guy because he's not bothering us. That bishop can be the bishop spong of spongs, write his books, but he's not bothering me. Uh, what's the worst that could happen? Well, sometimes if you let those things fester long enough, the worst that can happen is you, you've you lost the Episcopal Church. Yeah. You allow false teachers to arise, yeah. and false teachers spread their poison. Um, like the Diocese of the Southwest is doing heroic stuff in northern Mexico and in Places that uh, I hate to. The ACNA started off by basically planting churches in college towns and in the basically the low hanging fruit uh, in the Carolinas and and in college towns and this like that. Uh, there are no ACNA congregations here in Hooterville. Uh, they're down in Temp, you know, or or up in Gainesville in civilization. Um, but the Diocese of the Southwest is planting churches in northern Mexico. That's not low-hanging fruit. That's way up in the trees. Yes, it is. Yeah. And that work can be upset tremendously if you allow the C4SO stuff to go up, get out of hand or the, the, the women's stuff to get out of hand because they have women clergy in the Southwest and in Mexico. So in other words, if it, it, it can, how do you say, you know, well, what does it matter what happens in Franklin, Tennessee or Fort Worth, Texas in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico? Well, it does happen because people talk and they have a choice whether or not to attend a church. And if the issue and if the noise, background noise that they're hearing is that they're not welcome there or that they think these people are strange, you make things hard. You do. I mean, I mean, you make it very hard because remember back in 2003, people, Kevin, what church do you go to? Well, I go to the Episcopal Church, but not that Episcopal Church. You have to explain where you're going. You have to codify it. You have to uh, make an excuse. Well, you know, that I don't know what happened in New Hampshire. It's not what's happening in Connecticut. Well, guess what? It started to happen in Connecticut a year, you know, a year and a half later. You know, it doesn't take long for the festering, the, the false teaching, the heresy to take hold everywhere. And I, I flew up and back to Atlanta on Monday. Uh, yeah. Julius the dog has now been reunited with his mommy. Uh, okay. I see it. We, we say dog on the chair behind you over your left shoulder. Which one is that? 
that's Tara, and then there are two on the couch, uh, okay. Jasper and uh, Cosmo. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I uh, flew up and back to Atlanta. Frontier Airlines is cheap. It's like 100 bucks round trip, plus the 99 dog fee. It's cheaper than driving. But I dressed like this. And, you know, waiting in the airport in Atlanta, people come up, people come up to me. I don't know why. Maybe it's there's like sucker across my forehead, but people could talk to me and they talked to me about religious things. And um, when they find out I'm an Episcopalian, they basically have to find out, am I, you know, am I a nut job? Am I safe? Can I talk to you about these things? What sort of Episcopalian are you? Um, and I hate that because, you know, uh, I just wish, you know, I could serve the Lord without having to basically get out my union card and say, I'm a member of this, but the, 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 the Menshevik faction, not the Bolshevik faction of the communist party of the Episcopal church. Yeah. So, uh, please, uh, pray for the conclave that's going to, uh, choose the next archbishop. May it be one of fellowship, uh, one of worship, and one where we're not compromising, but uh, certainly uh, the Lord's choice walks out of that conclave uh, and is the next archbishop. It's being, held, it, it's being held at St. Vincent's College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And my memory of the last conclave was the cafeteria with fish sticks, stewed tomatoes, and macaroni and cheese. So... <laughs> Let's hope that I won't starve to death because I'm on a strict diet these days. Oh, my Lord. Uh, what day are you arriving there? I, I, no, I got the Flying plane tickets. Flying Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Uh, yeah. Tuesday. Well, I mean, if my wife gets out of the hospital, mm -hmm. I just have to find out what's happening. But sure. if everything holds current as it is today, my wife's been in the hospital since the beginning of May. Mm -hmm. And she may, if she gets out next week, then I'll have to rethink Sure. Because I don't know if I want to take her with me to Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and feed her fish sticks, macaroni and cheese, and stewed tomatoes. Uh, yeah, that was something. All right. What else we got in the news? So we got to finish up here. We're up to 47 minutes. Well, I know we got people. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, in here, the perfect example of is everybody on side here? Now, we reported a Fort Worth story about six or seven months ago, and we found out it wasn't true, that uh, the bishop went to speak somewhere, and we heard rumors that uh, they were going to join that organization and leave the, the ACNA. And we heard from right away the steering committee, what, what are you guys talking about? And of course, we're not doing that. So uh, when you see statements like this, that Fort Worth has published an agreement with the ACA that they're going to recognize each other's orders, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean the Bishop of Fort Worth is, is secretly trying to undermine the ACNA and leave? Or is this something else, George? It's confusing. Yes. The Constitution canons of the ACNA reserve to the primate in the College of Bishops ecumenical relations. However, Fort Worth can receive whoever it wants. Mm -hmm. So it can make ACNA, ACA, Anglican yeah. Church of America clergy into ACNA clergy of Fort Worth. But the standing committee released a statement signed by Bishop Ryan Reed of Fort Worth entering into some sort of ecumenical fellowship. Now, what exactly does that mean? And I, we, we got in touch with Andrew Gross and of the uh, ACNA presiding bishop's office, and he's going to check into it because on one hand I can go, oh, 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 look, Fort Worth is, you know, getting ready to burn the house down, or Fort Worth is just doing something local that has no impact on anybody else. Now, what's the bad thing? The Fort Worth can be a door for the ACA clergy who want to join the ACNA. So you can be an ACA clergy in Portland, Maine, and now be part of the ACNA, but now you've basically blown up the non-geographic problem. And, or, would, in other words, we need to get, how does this actually going to unfold? And because if the Constitution canon doesn't give Fort Worth the authority to do this, and then it's just a meaningless piece of paper. 
but if it allow, but we just need clarification. Oh, yeah, how this is work. yeah. Uh, uh, please uh, send George an email, uh, uh, Fort Worth. Uh, what's going on here? Is this nefarious, or is this like last time? What are you guys talking about? That would re that would really help well, us. It, out. it actually, <laughs> actually, it was a letter with yeah. Ryan Reed's signature. So it's more than just rumor. We've got it's the letter. Right. We got the letter. But yeah. what? How should we understand this letter? Mm -hmm. uh, is it a poke in the eye? Is it? gamesmanship before the uh, general of uh, the assembly is it just a statement of what's been on the ground facts on the ground we don't know let's moving on here global south has its major meeting in cairo the episcopal church is going to choose their next presiding bishop in louisville kentucky acna is going to choose their next archbishop uh, up in latrobe canterbury cathedral kind of felt like they're out of the news what could we do to get back in the news? There's got to be something. Maybe if we blessed gay unions, we could make the news again. George, what? <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> yep. Canterbury Cathedral is now a gay wedding venue. Uh, the dean, who was a gay partnered man, man put out a statement uh, yes, uh, yesterday, the 18th, saying Canterbury Cathedral has decided uh, in the spirit of LLF to allow gay blessings. And I thought LLF was not passed. I well, thought Welby it, held back and said, we're not going to go forward. Uh, he, yes and no. Uh, it, it, nobody really quite knows, but no. uh -huh. I, I talked to some people in England about this and I said, Did Justin Welby wait until the Cairo thing was done before he, because Welby has a history of being two-faced. In other words, telling group A this and group B that, even if they're in contradiction. Mm -hmm. So Welby can tell uh, the gay and lesbian Christian movement in England is support and all this and that. And then he'll send Anthony Pogo down to Global South meeting to say, I'm standing firm. We have not changed marriage. We're holding fast. We're trying to find a way forward, but don't worry. We'll still be on side. Meet the moment that meeting ends, the same day as the Global South communique comes out, Canterbury Cathedral announces gay marriage. What well, did Welby pull a fast one? And I asked my friends that. I said, no, Welby has so little political clout anymore that the dean probably felt that he could go ahead and do this without any sure. consequences. Because yeah. the Welby can't walk it back now that the dean's decided. And because Welby's made these statements, and so basically Welby's weakness is being exploited by activists on the gay side. Now that Welby did approve. Welby did approve the appointment of a partnered gay man to be to be dean. Um, the cathedrals of England are looking to be the gay uh, sector. The, the gay dean of Bristol, a lesbian yeah. dean of Bristol, appointed a gay vice dean. You know, so all the clergy at the Bristol Cathedral are gay. I mean, we're getting really there. Somebody I went to college with is uh, is now a gay dean. He, he, he was a gay. Somebody I went to Oxford with is, you know, now a dean and he's gay and everything. It's just where they're being shoved, uh, the high flyers. And, uh, you know, this is just. If this had been known at the Global South meeting, would this have shifted Singapore and South Sudan and Tanzania and other guys? Conceivably. Yeah, yeah we'll see. It, it, it was just interesting. We saved it for one of the last stories. Let's move on to the last story. Um, we got like five minutes left to stay under an hour. I doubt we're going to do that. So the people who want to hear a three-hour show may be happy. We'll see what happens. Uh, who is the real Calvin Robinson is the title. Now, Gavin Ashington, a, a friend of the program, a friend of Kevin and George, a previous co-host of Angle Unscripted, has put out a, uh, not a hit piece, a reveal piece uh, on Calvin Robinson discussing uh, his Catholicism or whether or not you can really call him Catholic. I have not watched it, George, and I discussed it in the pre-show, so I'm not talking with as much information as George will in a moment. But it's always important, and we've always done this as Christians since day one, who's on our side? Who's on side? 
We talked about that in the first couple of stories. It's, you know, the global South is trying to see who's on side. China wants to know who's on side. Uh, Fort Worth, you know, I mean, the whole gamut of Anglican scripted 863 is about who's on side. And Calvin Robinson is appreciated amongst, amongst Anglicans because he's on our side. We feel he's on side. Now, when you ask what is give what what's your your certificate your badge of honor where are you located as a Anglican or Catholic whatever it's a Nordic place somewhere far far away, so let's talk first about about Gavin's concerns and about being on side George. Well, Gavin put out almost an hour long interview uh, talk about uh, Calvin Robinson. Calvin's come back in the news. Last time mm-hmm. he was in the news in a major way was the blow up at Mere Charleston, Mere Anglicanism in Charleston, mm-hmm. where Calvin took a knife to uh, women's orders and and whatnot. Gavin Ashenden uh, basically took a knife to Calvin Robinson. Now they're they've been close. Gavin has been a mentor to mm-hmm. Calvin. Gavin attended his ordinations. Gavin has supported him, helped him, talked to him. And I don't want to say they've broken, but Calvin has made claims about Catholicism that Gavin, as a Roman Catholic, says he cannot accept. And so he spent a good hour eviscerating, in Gavin's mind, the historical and theological claims to Catholicism that Calvin Robinson was putting forward. Now, is this just gossip? No, not really, because Calvin is probably one of the best oh, uh, apologists out there for the Anglican way. He's a very clear, authentic speaker who can speak at the clergy level and lay level. It's not just, you know, he's not always speaking over your head. Mm-hmm. He was done very badly, done, you know, the the Diocese of London really screwed him over when they refused to make him a deacon. And he was ordained a deacon in the Free Church of England. And then, which was a bit of a surprise because the Free Church is extreme Protestant and Calvin is an Anglo-Catholic. And then the Free Church of England decided not to make him a priest. And so Calvin was ordained by the Nordic Catholic Church uh, one of the Utrecht uh, old Catholic groups into the priesthood and licensed in the Free Church of England. In his te- television show with uh, Lawrence, a uh, video podcast with Lawrence Fuck, uh, Calvin mentioned that he's giving up his tenancy in, tenancy in London, and there are rumors that he's going to be moving to the United States to pursue his ministry and uh, career. What does this mean if Calvin comes into the American Anglican world? Um, will he be received in the Diocese of Fort Worth? Will he, you know, there are some natural homes for Calvin. Absolutely. And if he does step up to be one, and he will be, wherever he lands, one of the most media savvy, most noticed, most quoted Anglicans. But what is his Anglicanism? And this is what Calvin, uh, this is what Gavin was saying is he's making a claim of, for Anglicanism that is not supported by you know, the Catholic Church and is not recognized by the evangelical or charismatic factions of the uh, American Anglican experience. So just folks keep this on your radar yeah i mean it's interesting calvin is you know we we love him he's as winsome as uh galvin in in a, in a different way and um uh i i would love to have him in america we certainly need somebody who stirs up the pot uh here and uh you know i'm sure he's still mad at me for you know charleston but life goes on All right, that's the episode of Eight. You do that. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 863 of Anglican Unscripted.